Hi, all. Thanks so much for joining Speaking of Making Healthcare Work for You, Different Perspectives and Empowering Solutions. I'm Stephanie Fields, joined by my co-host, Dr. Apoorv Gupta, and today we welcome Dr. Arvind Singhal, who is a professor at the University of Texas and specializes in positive deviance and teaches the only semester-long course in it. And additionally, he is an author of the upcoming book, which will be released on June 11th, and it is called Positive Deviance, A Radically Different Way of Solving the World's Problems. Thanks so much for being here, Arvind. Pleasure, Stephanie and Apurva. Thank you. So Arvind, tell us what is positive deviance? What does that mean? As, as you've heard, it's an oxymoronic uh, term. Uh, you know, we, those who are trained in a sociological sense would say deviance. I mean, you know, why do you want to get close to deviance in any way and positive deviance? Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, it's uh, a little different than our sociological uh, understanding of deviance. Uh, uh, it's really a statistical uh, deviation. Uh, and when you have a positive outlier for a given problem, so if you're trying to solve a problem, uh, you know, there are all those people who haven't solved the problem, they are the problem. Uh, but uh, perhaps uh, there are some who have uh, solved the problem. So they deviate positively from the norm, especially if they've solved the problem without any extra resources, or they've solved the problem against very high odds. So they are deviants because they are not the norm. They are positive because they've solved the problem. This is something that you said you've seen demonstrated in India in two villages that I guess would definitely be outliers from the current situation, which is pretty horrible. And you said that one has a fully vaccinated village, 100% vaccination, and the other one has had no COVID cases, despite the fact that other places have a 50% positive rate. So what is, a, what is it about situations like that where you can look at those two villages and say, whoa, what are they doing? How is this working? How are they using positive deviance? Yeah, and whether they even know that they're using uh, positive uh, deviance. I mean, clearly these two villages exist. Uh, one of the pieces that alerted me about this village that is 100% vaccinated uh, was uh, sourced uh, through National Geographic, a source that I trust. So, uh, and this is the one which has 100%, uh, you know, of the community members vaccinated. So clearly they're doing something different. And uh, in the case of the village where, you know, poor community, mostly agricultural, had a lot of resistance to vaccines. So, you know, facing the highest of high odds, uh, but over a period of time, in the last few months, given vaccines became available only in the last few months, uh, they have found a way uh, uh, to, uh, to not just uh, make these vaccines accessible, uh, but also acceptable. And uh, they've done so by small little things, you know, bringing in influencers from the outside, who would sit with influencers from the inside, you know, let's say the village chief or the, um, the village priest, uh, the village teacher, and, you know, they being the ones who get the first jab. And while these first jabs are happening, you know, there are little smartphones that capture that and, you know, that turns into small little trigger videos that go out on WhatsApp and you know, uh, then when a second round happens, a few more people are invited and, you know, you sort of get the idea. So it's uh, credibility, uh, trustworthiness, uh, going at things slowly and not telling people you should do this, but actually showing those who are getting it done. Uh, the involvement of the priest, uh, you know, brings in a certain aura uh, that uh, this is sacred, you know, you're doing this because this deity protects you and, you know, you have those kinds of blessings. So there are a whole host of not just, you know, biomedical uh, 
undercurrents here, you know, they're socio-cultural, religious, sacred, familiarity, trust, all coming together gradually. And you, you know, you proceed along those lines and given people are so connected, right? Uh, individuals who belong to families, families who belong to neighborhoods, and, uh, uh, you know, the priest, of course, is the village priest, the chief is the village chief, all these overlapping cascading networks, and uh, it tips, and it tips uh, enough that it's 100% now. That's so fascinating, Arvind. Uh, what, what I find when you've tried to teach me about uh, positive deviance over the years, uh, very grateful for that and for your joining the show. One thing that's always struck, uh, stuck out uh, to me is that these people are somehow solving this incredibly complex problem without any additional resources. And that's what you've said in your, in your couple of comments here as well. I mean, this is a village just like any other village in India. So they're not getting access to a grant uh, they don't have a wealth, wealthy philanthropist. Uh, they're not suddenly more educated, you know, than the other villages. And that's always the striking thing. All of the behaviors, the micro behaviors, as you call them for me, they all can be uh, undertaken by any village. Uh, and yet it's somehow one village that manages to put these micro behaviors together. And I find that really, really impressive that somehow without having to appeal to any external aid or new technology or new intervention, that you know, this is all within the grasp of all of us. So you know, I don't know. I'm I'm just restating what you've stated, said, but I'm hoping that you can underscore that as well and help our viewers yeah. understand how important that is. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, W. Edwards Deming, and you know, this is the guy who transformed uh, Japan and brought uh, uh, performance improvement and quality improvement uh, to the US. And I don't know much about his work, but I do know about, uh, he often talked about the four pillars uh, that make up uh, what he calls uh, profound knowledge. And uh, the first pillar, and he's basically saying, if you wanna improve something, if you wanna fix something, you know, you can go the route of, let's identify defects. And, uh, you know, that's quality control. And uh, in essence, what he's saying is, it is highly important to recognize that whatever you do, there's always variation, right? You know, when you have variation when you're building rivets or making rivets, defects and quality control. But in human systems, he says, when there is variation, or at least that's my interpretation. Uh, he says, and if you can pay attention to something that is varying a little more, and of course, you know, you always vary in terms of range and in terms of, you know, the range of deviations, uh, then it's important to pay attention to those. And if you begin to pay attention to the positive variations from quote unquote, the mean or the central tendency in a statistical sense, it can be very insightful. In fact, you know, Deming says it can be profoundly insightful. And so uh, here, you know, when, when I talk about this community, uh, it clearly is performing well, tremendously well, in the context of the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Now add to that, that it is also performing well with no extra resources. And this is like variation squared. And that's profound. You know, if I understand them, I mean, that's profound because it exists, right? I mean, you can deny that it, you know, it's not a pie in the sky. It's it's in the ground. And uh, so I think what, what we are saying here philosophically, statistically, is there is profundity when you see variations of that kind. And if you begin to pay attention to those as opposed to 
our habit of focusing on the defects because we are trying, we are fixers, right? We are engineers. We are repair people, right? This is not working, so you know, let's fix this. Of course, that is indeed the intention of the positive deviance approach too. You want to fix the problem, but you fix the problem by looking at variation squared because it exists and figuring out how did they get there because the key is there. And so it's, it's intriguing, right? I mean, it's in, even to a person who is very logically minded, it makes sense. But we don't think that way because we are not trained to think that way. And you said before that people, humans are a variation in themselves because when you were relating it to medical care, you said that the heart doesn't lie to the lungs and the liver doesn't lie to the stomach. They all, when they're giving you whatever symptom or feedback, that's accurate, real-time feedback. And it's not something made up. Whereas people have the ability to be in a meeting or you use the example when we were talking, being in an operating room and the surgeon being completely ready, gloved up, scrubbed in, totally ready to go. And then a beeper, beeper going off and touching it and having somebody having the nerve to say, you just touched that beeper. What is it about those people that is there any common thread in those people who are the difference maker, who are the deviants in, a, in the positive ways that people can replicate or that we can look to or recognize if we see somebody and think, oh, that's the person we need to be following? It's an excellent question. And I can answer that at multiple levels because positive deviance also is a very versatile approach. You can look at statistical deviance at multiple levels. You know, you can look at it at the level of individuals. Are there certain anesthesiologists who are doing a better job than others in terms of how they, you know, either they wheel their pediatric patients in or some who carry, very few who carry uh, them in, or, you know, surgeons who uh, engage in certain, I and mean, you can look at those things at the individual level, but you can also look at units. You know, how is the surgical intensive care unit doing relative to something else, uh, to the orthopedic unit? Maybe, you know, they have higher levels of infections because, you know, they're, you know, cutting uh, more and so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's a highly versatile approach. You can look at, uh, you can also do upstream and downstream intervening, right, with the positive deviance approach. So when I teach this class, basically I'm teaching them a different way to think, right? If you're interested in solving the problem among Hispanics in El Paso, Texas, right on the U.S.-Mexico border, because uh, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems is diabetic management. Uh, you know, you can ask the question, are there men and women over the age of 40 who have a diagnosis of type two, who are poor, don't have medical insurance, but yet who have been able to control their diabetes because they have a certain, you know, level of A1C, 6.5 with no, or just the bare minimum 500 milligrams of metformin. And if the answer is yes, then, whoa, you know, we found, and you know, as, and I'm just narrating these studies because we have done these studies. So you can look at positive deviance at the level of diabetic management. There's no reason why you can't go upstream and ask the question, are there families uh, where you would expect children to be obese? Yeah, uh, with the same socio-demographic characteristics. And are there some positive deviance among those? You get the idea? You can also go downstream, right? Uh, in terms of those uh, uh, who have re rehabilitated themselves, let's say, in a better way after they've had an amputation, right? So you can go, you know, prevention, uh, management, uh, rehabilitation, mitigation, 
And that's the beauty of the positive deviance approach because you're basically saying there's variation in practice, variation in population's practice at, these, at the continuum of upstream, downstream, prevention, management, rehab, treatment, you know, whatever else. And so now you can really develop a very comprehensive approach to the problem that you're trying to solve. And ordinarily we are very piecemeal. Yeah, we are, and nothing wrong with it. I mean, that's the way we've been uh, trained uh, to, uh, to think. I think you've also brought out to me in the past that it, it, the whole inquiry starts with data. Because in order to know whether you're deviant, positive or negative, you have to have a sense of what is the data, what is the mean, uh, and so yeah. what is the deviation. And and so yeah. one thing that's striking me as you're saying, uh, you know, you you were providing your last comment, is is it possible that ultimately all we're trying to figure out is what are the variables that could potentially uh, be implicated in this data, and and the positive deviant is just one for whom we haven't identified what that variable is. Um, and, and or is there something is there something that's still an untapped skill or potential in that person that we haven't somehow figured out how to capture? You use data. You can use data. There are other ways uh, to ask who is at the highest risk, right? Uh, against all odds, over the age of forty, Hispanic, no medical insurance. You get the idea. Diagnosis of type two, mm -hmm. you know, they have the highest odds and they shouldn't be managing their diabetes well. And then of course you flip, you ask the somersault question. And for that data is very helpful, right? If you have access to it, are there some students who shouldn't be performing well because they're first generation, English is not their first language, poor socioeconomic status. I mean, all the high risk factor, oh my God, but, you know, they're graduating with a 3.8 GPA and, you know, blah, blah. Oh, okay, right? So data is very useful where it exists. Now, the question you're asking is, is there a variable which explains, uh, and that is hyper-local and hyper-contextual. Uh, you know, so it would be hard for me to say, oh, however, having said that, given we deal with complex social problems, given I'm a professor of communication, uh, usually the little thing that tends to make the biggest difference, and obviously it's a little thing which doesn't cost anything, no extra resources, is a behavioral act, a micro behavior, or two or three. The anesthesiologist in question, uh, what is it that she does that others don't do? Well, she comes and she asks for permission. Mr. and Mrs. Singal, do I have permission to pick up your baby? <gasps> oh, right. Hmm. Yeah, well, yes, please. As opposed to, well, I'm gonna pin, pin the baby down. Uh, and, you know, so there's care, uh, there's holding, uh, nonverbal, but very relational, yeah. And now she's administering verbal anesthesia. That's a communicative act, right? Peekaboo. Interaction, no? With a child, right? While simultaneously, you know, the assistant locates. And now, you know, better clinical outcomes because you're not jabbing it five times before it, you know. And then uh, she asks for permission to carry your baby to the surgical room, no? to the operation theater. Now that's a communicative act. And then as she walks four steps, she turns, she turns, she looks at you, she makes eye contact. She pats your child on the back and says, and you may not hear her words, but this says he's gonna be okay. And you know, what does it do to you when you know the anesthesiologist who's gonna put your baby to sleep is telling you he'd be okay with me. Ah, so it's a series of little to answer your question and to answer Stephanie's. Uh, you can tell because it's you know very hyper local, hyper contextual. But given it doesn't cost anything, 
It has to be a behavioral act or two, a series of behavioral acts. Often these behavioral acts are communicative in nature and they create a different kind of a healing space. But Arvind, I think you just kind of nailed it for me. Again, every time I speak with you, I feel that I'm actually unpacking the layers of positive deviance and you sort of just brought it out. It's the micro behavior that you're looking for is often about the relationship and about the communication, both of which come freely to all of us. They're available freely to every single one of us, yet only a few of us are accessing them. So if I'm getting that correct, then I guess the question still comes back to, is there a particular skill then that these positive deviants have somehow learned that they've taken up and that's what's helping them solve these problems? And is that the skill that we're trying to distill uh, unto others? Apurva, you're coming at this question in a way that uh, somebody who teaches positive deviance is going to say, Apurva, hold on, because it is the discovery of what is happening that is uncommon and different, which is you know, very context sensitive for a given problem. Uh, so uh, I don't know whether I'd go that far uh, but I would say maybe if I do a meta study systematically of all the, but I can certainly say that if you begin to pay deep attention, uh, if you work in a space which is, which has a complex environment in terms of hierarchies, if you begin to pay attention to the quality of the relationship quality of the relationship, quality, not one time, quality of the relationship as it plays itself out uh, through these micro actions and repetitions of these micro actions, uh, you will see that that takes you to a different place. And because these actions are so micro, you know, we usually say, oh, that was nice. Oh, I read, you know, I, I, I love this doctor, right? I, you know, the guy, he asks me first to sit down and he sits down. He doesn't ask me what's wrong with you. No, 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 no. You know, he begins the conversation in a different manner. He begins by asking me, uh, hey, did you get those pictures developed from your last trip to the Grand Canyon? Why? Because, you know, he charts uh, this personal stuff along with your blood pressure. And, and he knows from your last visit that your son was playing on the varsity basketball team and was trying to, you know, mm -hmm, get to the university team. and. If he asked, so usually those who go that, I don't even want to call it extra mile because you'd say that everybody should do this, right? Uh, who go that mile, given it violates the norm of expectancy, uh, this violation of the norm of expectancy in a positive manner is what delivers better. What is the number one message you want people to take away when they get your book? Humility, humility, humility. Uh, fundamental principle of positive deviance is I don't know, but somebody here knows. Somebody here has solved the problem. You can get it through data. Uh, it, it's very liberating. Uh, because you don't have to be the expert. Uh, of course, you have your expertise. Your expertise is to relinquish your expertise temporarily. And uh, because the answers are there, because there's always variation, profound knowledge. Well, thank you very much. I love this conversation. I learned a lot and it was just fascinating. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Pleasure. Stephanie, Thank you so pleasure. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you.